To Tech Talk Taco Tuesday. This is live from Pahrump. Tech Talk Taco Tuesday, number 74. Yes. I'm here with myself, who nobody knows, but I'm here with the ultra famous Logan Tyler. Yep. Who uh, does your ad reads, and I'm here with the uh, Dirt Bike Tests. Uh, do we do we give you a title yet, Ty- uh, to Logan? Logan. <laughs> um. Logan Tyler. See how good I am with names, even even. <laughs> Trevor, Trevor, do you do you work for us? Um, <laughs> maybe, sometimes. maybe, yeah. But you have to get paid to get considered to be working, right? Yes. So uh, it's called a fun at this point. Yes. Yeah. So uh, Trevor Hunter is here. Trevor is uh, what are you our, our main test rider? You can call it that, yeah. Main test rider slash uh, uh, social media poster. I'll take it. Got yeah. it. Uh, so that is the crew here tonight uh, for our third try at um, recording <laughs> Tech Talk Taco Tuesday. This is going to be even harder than the other one to edit, Logan. Oh, yeah. And Logan's been doing a great job of editing, like we talked about earlier. Uh, he's been the one getting these things up on the YouTubes. And... Uh, I'm Jimmy Lewis. I'm sort of the host of the show, and I'm the guy that uh, answers nine out of ten questions that you ask me uh, very quickly. And I'm going to run through this quickly because everybody that's live had heard this before. Ask questions on YouTube. Send Trevor at DirtBikeTest.com your question. Find Logan on Instagram and ask him your question or comment on this wherever you see it, and we'll try to get your question answered for you. Um, and uh, I don't think I'm going to apologize tonight to the one guy I didn't answer his question last week. But uh, the show's brought to you by who? Um, Climb and Recluse and KTM. And uh, Trevor, who rides, who wants to ride a Yamaha but currently rides a KTM, <laughs> will now read your KTM ad slogan. <laughs> KTM, powered by a distinct ready-to-race mentality. KTM is the world's leading high-performance street and off-road sport motorcycle manufacturer with North American headquarters based in Murrieta, California. Over the years, KTM has built a reputation as a fierce competitor on racetracks around the world, and the brand's remarkable global success is reflected in every product it develops and every move it makes. That was good, Trevor. You almost almost have the radio voice going. Almost. Um, tonight I'm having uh, El Jim Ador, uh, by the way. That's my, uh, that's my tequila of choice. Bob, you know where I got this? <laughs> it yeah, came. I thought you said it was crap. So it it must come from me. Yeah, it's yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I got it in some box that you delivered up from Mexico about twenty years ago. That probably sat outside at your house. <laughs> Um, it was never in the sun, but uh, the plastic cap didn't do it any favors. But it, uh, they say it doesn't go bad, so I'll have a little bit later on. Um, let's get right into the uh, right into the the comments. Actually, let me let me see that clipboard because I'm going to work our way through the beginning because I put some special ones in here. Um, if you don't know, Recluse makes uh, really fine clutches, and they make left hand rear brakes. Which uh, Bob, I told you I had a surprise for you today, right? Oh, you didn't see that text. No wonder you're oh, here. I was afraid somebody was here that I owed money to. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, so Bob, we got you the brand new Recluse rear left hand rear brake because you are a fan of those. Yeah. Yeah, that's going to go on your KTM 350, and then you're going to test it for us because you are one that is accustomed to it, used to it, you like it, and I'm the other side of the spectrum. And notice I haven't said whether it's good or bad yet because actually I have to evaluate it to see how it works because I've used the old ones and you've used the intermediate ones between there and now. And then now there's the brand new one. So we're going to find out how it works because I'm not a fan. <laughs> and, and, but would you want to always walk around with crutches? I, I don't think it's a crutch. <laughs> it might be an advantage. I mean, imagine if, you know, like, remember <laughs> we always, we always bring up the Husky auto transmission bikes. You had brake pedals on both sides. Yeah. I did. Yeah, that way you can. It didn't matter which it way. Still didn't help it now. <laughs> yeah, so that way you can lean the bike either way, and you can still use the rear brake. So same with this. Yeah. So it could be an advantage. We don't know. Well, I I know that I have a hard time adapting. So, anyways, but Recluse has just released a brand new. Uh, I want to call it maybe version 3.0 uh, left hand rear brake. Uh, so that is uh, something we're going to be testing here real soon. And then Climb makes really awesome motorcycle gear. And they make some casual clothes, which Logan is wearing. Is that the only sh- shirt you wear on this show? Um, you save it for Tuesday? 
Pretty much. <laughs> How come you don't wear a dirt bike test t-shirt? They're pretty cool too. Yeah. Yeah. You should go get one. You, you, you actually, for all the hard work, you can go grab a new, a new style because you're small, right? Medium. Uh-oh. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's good. We have, we have more mediums than we do small. So um, both Trevor and uh, that's how I'm paying Trevor and Logan was with t-shirts uh, to, to get this <laughs> stuff done. So, hey, thanks everybody for joining in. Uh, thanks for um, handling our take one and two and then back at take three. Um, uh, and I do need to announce out loud that Trevor needs a Yamaha ride. So if you or anybody you know is super tied in with a Yamaha dealer that can, can, that can provide Trevor with the, uh, a dealer support ride, we have a plan for you. Uh, so you've got to get in. Actually, Trevor's got to come find you or if you got to let us know because uh, he's Blue Crew. He, yes. likes, he likes the blue bikes. He rides them better. I don't know what's wrong with him, uh, <laughs> but uh, actually, I do know what's wrong with him. I like them, too. <laughs> They're really good. Uh, so um, if you're a Yamaha dealer looking for a little bit more exposure than you would ordinarily get from a regular um, racer, uh, he does pretty awesome videos at most of his races. Uh, he's personable. He doesn't say much, but like sometimes those are the best people, unlike me. I won't say anything bad. Right. Yeah. I just talk too much. And they're like, shut up, Jimmy. <laughs> Go away. Um, how's that Husaberg treating you? Huh? Oh, Husaberg, huh? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> 570, my friends. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, they're not a sponsor of the show, by the way. No, there's no four stroke force in here. Uh, that the KTM managed to make Husaberg go away. So I won't talk about that. But they did take most of the good stuff from Husaberg, except for that 70-degree, 570cc single. Have you, have you ridden one? I'm scared to. Yeah. Yeah, it you know, makes a lot of power. It's amazing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We could talk about it for hours, and we're not going to. We're going to stop right here. <laughs> Unless there's a question about one later on, which there might. Uh, so, anyways, Yamaha dealers uh, or somebody with Yamaha contacts, uh, get in touch with Trevor real quick. So, Bedouin75 uh, says, what do they say, Logan? Uh, thanks for this review. This is an actual real-world useful info. Well, I was pretty impressed that <laughs> we do give out actual real-world useful info on our uh, review video. So, uh, yeah, thanks for that, Bedouin. Um, if you're curious about what he's talking about, you should probably haven't seen uh, one of our bike test videos, which are pretty, you know, kind of nuts and bolts to the point uh, <laughs> reviews, right? Why are you laughing? Oh, I saw the Trevor hits donkey. <laughs> George <laughs> just yeah. George threw up Tre in the Trevor. Trevor will hit a donkey for you, and then get you lots of YouTube videos on the <laughs> no. Yeah, no, I no, I don't want to ever see that again. <laughs> Me Our next question: Who's that from? Um, Paul Van Hout. Okay, what do we want to know? Thanks for the recommendation on the Recluse Slave Cylinder for the FE three hundred and fifty. Tell Recluse you probably sold one of their slave cylinders. Probably. I don't like that word. I like I like you to be more definitive when you say, pro, you know, like probably means he probably hasn't bought it yet. And I want to know, I, I want to, actually, Paul, when you buy it and it works better and it lasts a long time, then email me and say, you know, say, hey, I bought that thing. It worked great. It was awesome recommendation uh, because I gave it an awesome recommendation. That's why I turned you in that direction. Uh, not because I was guessing or because Recluse does help support the show. So there we go. Next. Todd DW92345. Do you ever wonder if that's his, um, like if you could dive into him and, and is that his password for something? Those, those oh, 92345. You ever wonder about that sometime <laughs> with the names? I'm not a hacker or anything like that, but just, just saying. Okay, what's the... Thanks for keeping the great content coming. Oh, now you made me feel bad. The, the guy that gives us a compliment, and I'm trying to teach you how to hack his account. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's, that's all we do here. But um, like today, like this is bad content because we've, all of our live viewers, we've tortured you through three resets on our, on our live stream because uh, we need uh, more technical proficiency in here. And, um, but yeah, no, thanks, Todd, for uh, watching our stuff, even through the thick and thin of it. But we've got some bad content coming, I promise you. We'll, we'll, well, I'm sure we'll do that again. 
Uh, what does Sparker245 want? He says very cool. What do you think he's talking about? What's the- very cool? Like, we're not cool. We're just guys talking about dirt bikes and and what? You know, that's a lead into something. Dirt bikes <laughs> and? Dirt, like, dirt bike related products. Right. By the end of the show, I'll have you guys all <laughs> all keyed into our little catch catchphrases. Uh, and then Charlie Tuna. Um, just picked up a 2018 KTM 500 EXCF because of Jimmy Lewis. Right on. Wow. No, because of dirt bike test. Because if it wasn't for dirt bike test, um, I wouldn't have as loud of a voice as I do. Because uh, that's the way it works. Um, but that is the best bike known to man. Um, the KTM 500 EXC. For everybody. You sure about that? As a blanket statement? Yeah. What, okay, <laughs> well, let's, okay, let's argue. <laughs> What what's a better bike? I don't know. For it, doing for doing everything. Anything blue. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> says the guy who currently races for Three Brothers KTM. Mike Rorich, I hope you're listening. <laughs> <laughs> who does a really good job at promoting them and he's but he's but he's ready to move on. Hey, well, um well, I can say I've never ridden one, so I have I, no idea. You've never ridden a KTM five hundred? No. EXC? No. You've never oh. ridden the five seventy Hooseberg? Yeah. I haven't ridden the Hooseberg either though. He's he's just like a you have? No, I have not. Oh, you're like a little puppy. I'm sheltered. So, so much, so much cool stuff ahead of you, Trevor. <laughs> and it's all it's it's literally one garage over that way. I didn't want to peek too early, so yeah. I'm building my way up to the best bikes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, uh, uh, what's our next one? Carolyn, Kate, Caitlin Carpenter. Um. Hey, Jimmy. Where's the best place to mount a GoPro? Does a helmet or bike mount make better videos? Trevor. Because I don't know this. This is your area. Oh, man. Um, Best place to mount a GoPro. I've never mounted one on a bike. I've never been a... Because f- I've never been a fan of how it usually looks. Like, it's usually super shaky and... Yeah, lots of not, vibration. Yeah, it's not my favorite, but... I've I've done them down, like, kind of low in front of the handlebars for... for uh, on the adventure bike because it's a little bit farther away mm-hmm. and, it, and it shows how much you have to move on the bike. It looks weird, especially... If you mount it to the handlebars, because mm-hmm. then you see the the bike pivoting and stuff. But you have to be careful in my world with the bike mounts because there's a lot of vibration and uh, and then they get broken off. I I used to use what I called faux pros, which were fake uh, GoPros, those really cheap ones. I'd mount them to swing arms and to shocks and frames, <laughs> and and uh, and they'd fall off and run get run over, and got some interesting stuff. Uh, but um, if I was putting a Five hundred dollar GoPro, and I'd be a little more concerned. Um, what about chest versus helmet? Um, I'm not. I'm not a huge fan of the chest either, just because it seems to get too much of the handlebar in the view. Um, some people like that, but it kind of block to me. Like I watch it to watch the terrain, not necessarily the bike or the rider. Um, oh, good. I'm glad. I'm glad you said that. But keep going. My personal favorite would probably be under the visor. But you have to be careful, depending on some helmets, it'll block your field of view. Um, It's like the Fly Formula helmet, for example. I can mount it under the visor, and it's kind of out of the way. I don't notice it, but my bell, I've got to be careful on mounting it there. And it gets in the way of the goggles and other things. Yeah, I. so a lot of times I use the chest mount. And like you said, it's because you see too much of the bike. But that's what, when I'm wearing one, it's because we're testing the bike yep. and I'm not trying to look for a better line or, you know, analyze, you know, where I'm going racing wise. It's yep. more about, you know, want to see the bike moving. And so I guess uh, the best thing probably is just play around with it yeah, and see, you know, see what works for you, what kind of a story you're trying to tell. Um, I, I literally, like I have a bunch of clamps and so I'll mount them on the bike and I'll mount it on, I'll, I'll wrap it around my wrist because I'm like showing what my wrist hand's doing. I'll show what my clutch hand is doing, just different things. And, 98% of the footage I get is absolute crap. So <laughs> take that for what it's worth. <laughs> What's next? We're talking about the Tenere 700. Uh, T-Mac D. It was hard enough finding one of those in a shop. Now it is, has the Lewis him and her sh- stamp approval. Who knows when the wife and I see one in person thanks for a great approach to your review guys well that's uh you know thanks to heather for actually uh 
you know, doing that review with me. And I'm glad that I helped shepherd those off showroom floors so you can't see one, I, I think. I don't know. Is that a compliment or am I getting <laughs> in trouble there? Uh, but, yeah, you, I, I think I think they, the second batch seemed like it hit because I saw people posting on the internets that they were getting their thing. You got to be careful with all that noise there, Trevor. It, actually, put the headphones on and you can hear what you just did. I'm good. You're good? <laughs> <laughs> I know what I just did. Yeah. It sounded like, it sounded like there was somebody popping popcorn of some sort. <laughs> I know you need to stay hydrated, the super fit elite athlete that you are. Um, I'm actually doing, you didn't hear me doing 12 ounce curls over here, did you? did actually you did i did oh wait, and i cracked it or i just gurp did i burp yeah i think you burp <sighs> hey uh I was impressed nonetheless. t mac d thanks <laughs> <laughs> thanks for the compliment and stuff um dual sport fan fran dual, dual sport fran um thanks jimmy as always an excellent review hit all the areas that is i was interested in well, at least he didn't go into talking about how Heather helped him hit all the areas he was interested in on that video. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you had to watch the show about five episodes ago, and you'd understand that joke. Uh, lots of talk about the KTM 390, but I wasn't really interested in the in the comments. I was more interested in, we're going to play What's That Ooh. Name? <laughs> Pass it over to Trevor. He hasn't played this before. What's I think our he did one. No, Matt did. Oh, yeah? What's What's the... <laughs> Who wants to know what? We got Erkan Erkan Osten. Erkan Osten? Let me fl flash that over here so I can see. Erkan, Ur yeah. O what is it when you put the two dots over the O? What is that? Ooh. Usten. Usten. Erkan Usten. Okay. Um, KTM 390 Adventure. Nothing like it the best. It was, it was a fun bike. It's the limited time I had on it. it nothing like, like it. You should ride it now. Uh-oh. Yeah. Is no. We, Jimmy Fied? We, we're working on it. We tuned it a little bit. Uh, and if you're a fan of that bike, uh, wait till we start dropping these videos on the hop-ups that we got going. Logan liked it, yeah? Yeah. Yeah. I actually, like we talked about, we so we put W wheels on it. We got spoked, you know, spokes. Mm -hmm. We replaced the mag wheels and we got spoked wheels on it. And it actually felt like it sharpened up the handling. It it made it in the and the thing is, the wheels are just slight wee bit heavier, and it actually may have helped that bike quite a bit. Um, uh, I liked it. You like it, Logan? Yeah. Yep. Uh, I, I think I could make it better. How? Blue plastic. <laughs> <laughs> we need some. Yamaha has a TTR, w, a WR, they quit making that thing, the WR250F, I think WR250R, they stopped making that, but... It's nothing like that KTM. KTM is way better just because it's the KTM. You should you should take that thing for a spin. Actually, you, you're, that's almost your size of adventure bike. That's perfect. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, maybe while you're out here, you can take a spin on that sucker. Um, what's our next? Uh, um, Kara Ning. <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, Kira Ning. Kira. Car yeah, Kira Knig. Knig. <laughs> um, how about riding in mud or river crossings? Uh it's the same as any other bike in mud or river crossings, I guess. <laughs> I, um <laughs> I don't know. Um so he's talking about the KTM 390 adventure. Uh so we didn't do a whole lot. Actually, we did snow. Yeah, we did snow and mud. It was fine. Um River crossings, uh, we rode across. We splashed out of a puddle, and that's the, that was the extent of it. But I don't, I don't really know that that's a. I mean, maybe mud. I think river crossings it'll be fine as anything. The airbox draw is up high and kind of behind the gas tank, and maybe that's what you're alluding to with that question. But I think it's going to be fine as almost any other bike. Um, unlike those Yamahas you like so much that draw the air intake <laughs> off the front snorkel, and when you ride behind somebody and the snort it goes straight into that snorkel, it can be bad times. I, I could see that. You, it's good because it, it draws it up high, but it's bad when the, the stream goes right into the, the snorkel. They actually, on I know somebody was making these little deflectors for the, the front of the, the, the YZs and WRs mm -hmm. so that, that that couldn't happen because it could happen. Um, but 
for the most part, and in fact, the Yamaha is a lot better going through deep water crossings. I'll just yeah. have, you know, almost as good as this other bike that I'm really fond of. It's called a, a Hoosaberg. <laughs> yeah, and it, it was How back in the... <laughs> the ones I ride are 570s. Uh, okay. Yeah, it, it, it's fun, kind of funny because it has so much power. It's like you don't actually ride through the water, you part the sea. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, we're we're going to kind of move down the questions there. I, I, got, I think I got a question in the... Um, Dallas Theobald. Yeah, you saw that. Um, Dallas, remember Dallas, uh, we got a call in with Dallas. He uh, won the Ironman Amateur Class in Vegas, Torino, a couple weeks ago. Super nice guy. He says, Jimmy, I've got a question. I bought a Klim Climb. <laughs> Klim <laughs> Climb, Clicky Climb. How do you say how do you say it? Climb. A Climb F5 dirt bike helmet to support the channel and the brand. Wow, that's good. Tried it on before I bought it and loved it. Used it a few times and really liked the lightweight and awesome venting. Took it to the race and they failed me at tech because it didn't have any safety rating. I was pretty surprised myself. I guess I'm assuming a six hundred dollar helmet from Climb would have thorough safety rating. It turns out it didn't. Thoughts? Okay, so I do know a little bit about this. Actually, Skylar Howes, your buddy Skylar, who probably also influenced you to buy a Climb helmet, can tell you a little bit about this too. No, no, it wasn't Skylar. It was um, it was the other American that went over. Uh, it was uh, Kyle McCoy had a Climb F5 at the Dakar Tech inspection, and the helmet got failed. And the reason it got failed is because you might want to look this. Oh, wait, you've got the ECE one, didn't you? Smart move for safety. Uh, bad move because it doesn't have a DOT sticker on it. And that's what they're looking for in the United States. They look for a DOT sticker. And I know a little bit about this because Kyle brought it up um, when I was talking to him. He had his helmet, his Climb F5, a brand new one at Dakar. And the, 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 the certification, the ECE certification was was on the little um, the little sweatband that's on the the helmet strap, which is removable, and it has to be permanently affixed to the helmet. And the fact that that because that's just where they started sewing them on because, but you can actually take that sweatband off. So since it was removable, they wouldn't allow them to pass. So they they actually had to get a whole bunch of documentation. He ended up was able to race with it after they they sewed the the the, the sweatband onto the helmet liner or whatever it was or onto the, the helmet strap but climb does sell helmets that are non-dot certified they're ece and so essentially what you got was quote a snowmobile helmet and to take this for what it's worth this is kind of what i've understood from this because snowmobiles don't ride on the street and you don't need and in fact on a dirt bike helmet you do not need to wear a helmet when you ride a dirt bike although if you don't you're kind of well, you're a brain donor. <laughs> so, um, but in order to wear a helmet on the street, it has to be DOT approved. And the DOT standard, in my opinion, and the opinion of a lot of other people that really understand helmets, is not as good as the ECE standard. And when you make a helmet DOT approved, you actually have to add weight to the helmet in ways that aren't necessarily that much better for safety, especially off-road riding safety, especially at smaller head sizes. And so there's companies that decide to sell an EC-approved helmet. That's what I wear, by the way. So I think that's what happened to your helmet. You have an EC helmet, and your organization is looking for a DOT stamp of approval, and that helmet did not have it. Um, there are other brands also that sell ECE helmets. They're lighter, um, although they're probably the same strength uh, when, if you were to use the helmet under the majority of circumstances in crash data, if I'm putting that properly. And the reason I know a lot about this is we did a very extensive helmet test when I was at Dirt Rider Magazine. Uh, we used a company called Collision Dynamics and a very knowledgeable uh, couple of uh, grad students and uh, one of their mentors to do the testing. It was all done anonymously. And we um, found out a lot about helmets. And when you ask Jimmy, what Jimmy says, hey, what helmet should I get? Um, I'm going to tell you how I would choose a helmet. Number one, it has to fit. I don't care anything else about the helmet. The most important thing you can do. Hey, Logan, make a note to say we're talking about helmet safety tonight. On, so we put it on the, on the thing. That should be the first thing because this is important stuff. 
the mm-hmm. number one most important thing is fit above anything else. Because if your helmet doesn't fit, every other testing criteria takes a dump, including how much you paid for it, by the way. Okay? Because everybody always goes back to the, like, well, I paid this much. You can pay a lot for an improperly fitting helmet, and you're paying way too much. So number one is fit. Number two in Jimmy's testing criteria is weight. F equals MA. We mention that all the time, and I didn't study physics that much, and I've had other people. Uh, it doesn't even matter if the helmet's black, Martin. It, it Weight, F equals MA. That's a stab for Martin. I was on his podcast last week. Uh, check out the Tour of Idaho and the motorcycle jazz stuff. Uh, weight. The lighter the weight for the most uh, it's going to be less force for the most part. And until you start getting to catastrophic level impacts, you can't add enough weight to the helmet to make it more safe. If that makes any sense. If you start thinking about it, the, the and catastrophic level is, uh, I don't even know the G forces, but we talked about it in, in that test a little bit. So fit, right? Logan weight. Number two, and number three, the third most important thing is understand the standards that your helmet passes. And that's what we were just talking about. DOT versus ECE versus Snell. And there's a couple other standards. And they're literally, there's a lot of very smart people that are trying to work on making a dirt bike only type motorcycle testing protocol that we can certify helmets with. This was what part of the the, the grad students who were working on that helmet test that I provided them literally $30,000 worth of helmets to smash, to learn about what would be a good, and they didn't just smash them in this test to, to test them for us. They were learning about what different designs criteria, what would be a good criteria for helmet testing. They were getting information from uh, the asterisks. Now the, um, the uh, Alpine stars medical unit at the races. I think it's Alpine. Is that who's sponsoring it these days? Yeah. Alpine Stars Medical Unit, the races with Doc Bodner, they were getting um, data from concussion data from those guys because they knew what brand those guys were wearing. They knew what they, they were able to get those helmets back. These guys are doing exhaustive studies to talk about how can we make helmets better? They didn't care what brand it was. They didn't care uh, anything. They, they knew what injury the rider sustained. It was videotaped or usually had they had really good camera angles of it they had the helmet they could analyze the helmet and they were learning about then they would take that same helmet and hit it onto certain things to simulate a similar impact and you know take the data and tie all that stuff together to make some recommendations on how to make safer helmets and what would be a good test to test motorcycle helmets for a dirt bike user um so number one what's number one uh, correctly fitting. Number two. Um, wait. Wait, yeah. You cheated him. <laughs> you cheated. And Trevor, what's number three? Knowing the safety rating. Knowing the standards the helmet passes. Yeah. What what helmet? Yeah. That's why I'm very fond, out of all the testing that's currently done, I'm most fond of the ECE testing standard. Um, it produces the lightest helmets, and those helmets in our tests tended to perform better than helmets that had other standards. So take that for what it's worth. Uh, I'm just relaying information and you can go back and find that article someplace. (laughs) Uh, Hopefully God only knows what they've done with all the uh, time I put in at uh, that magazine (laughs) and where that stuff went to probably just got thrown away. They probably just kept the cigarette ads and left everything else out in the open. Um, Rusty Nail says the next Tenere shipment in uh, USA is mid-October per the local dealer in, uh, I think it's Minnesota. Um, Chuck Dawson, who actually used to sponsor me back when I was like a KX80 rider racing motocross from, I think it was called Kawasaki Central in Oxnard, (laughs) California. Have you had a chance to ride a Husky TE150i? I have not ridden the Husky. I've ridden the KTM version. So uh, something very similar. Uh, I would like to ride one more. <laughs> <laughs> I like those things. I need a 300 first before I really anything else. Um, 
What else do we have going on here? Um, has KTM changed the six gear ratio in the 20 to 21 350 EXCF over the 2019 models to a more usable gear? Uh, I've ridden your bike, right? Yours is a 20. Yeah. And I complained about the f sixth gear. I don't think they changed the ratio. They don't change. I don't think so either. I don't believe they changed anything inside the gear ratios on that. So, um, Dave, uh, Raba, 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 Coyote. How do you say that, Logan? Got it? <laughs> oh. Raba's, Ch 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 Coyote? Coyote? Coyote. Yeah, Dave Raba Coyote. Thanks for, thanks for butchering your name, Jimmy. <laughs> <laughs> um, what's our next question on the list there, Logan? Um. Real question or name that person? <laughs> oh, yeah, name that person. Oh. Well, we're, we're going down that road. <laughs> Might as well. <laughs> he, he says, lovely review. I actually responded back to, um, what do you call him? Him or her. Well, we don't know. It's yeah. Actually, make, lo make re read it. <laughs> v uh, vidja, ya, ba. Ska. Oscar. You just sound it out. That's what they say, right? Just uh, sound it out. Say it. You, you, whatever you say, it's the it's the it's that word right there. Vija a Vijaya Baskar. Baskar. Vijaya Baskar. Vijaya Bas. There we go. There we go. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Lovely review. And I said lovingly back to you. <laughs> That's a, that's, I'm glad we do lovely reviews on, on dirtbiketest.com. Uh, that's over on a YouTube channel. If you're wondering how a bike works, uh, if you, if one of the few lucky bikes that we had the time and budget to go out and test properly, uh, is one of those bikes, then, um, yeah, we do lovely reviews. Jim Doyle. Um, Jimmy, would you, a recent model stock RMZ 250 or similar 250 four stroke make a good tight woods bike for a six foot one 230 pounder rider i know it's not really a trail bike but was thinking with my weight the suspension would be plenty plush for trail riding riding at 400 riding a 400 now but wanting something lighter for tight trails um, it's funny because the first thing I, when I saw that email from, uh, Joe was, yeah, the RMZ 250 would be a great, like if you were picking of all the 250s, I thought the RMZ 250 would be the, a great one for if you were going motocross only. But then I remembered what the Yamaha runs like, right? <laughs> yes. Like, like it makes, in my world, it makes the Suzuki the second best choice. Yeah. I think I've, I spent quite a bit of time on our Suzuki 250 test bike that we had this year and uh to me the yamaha and the suzuki power is very similar on the just, on the low just the yamaha is everything's elevated time, times 10 times so very the times Suzuki's, 10 maybe yeah, something like that maybe 10 percent. 10 percent. yes yeah okay yeah that's not times 10 yeah because the suzuki how, is very, how, you, how you doing in math classes i haven't taken one in a couple years really I'm, shows I'm right just, i'm right, too Logan? smart I just too did smart. You, did I you? Did you? Them. <laughs> passed them all early. <laughs> yeah. But uh, but the Suzuki, at least in stock trim, the suspension is really stiff. Yep. Um, so even if you're 230 pounds, like he says, I'd still almost say it's too stiff for trail riding. Because it, it's not. It's, it's not like it's not like um, it's it's got like an initial stiffness. It's stiff all the way around, but very initially it's very very stiff. Very yes. stiff. Yeah. 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 So, um, in in so, but beyond that, the, the so you're going to suffer with any motocross bike off road for a couple of reasons. Number one, tall first gear. Generally, on the off road bikes, the first gear is kind of tall, and even with some of the bikes that are converted, like the Honda CRF RX, the Yamaha FX is the one that does it right. They put a different yeah. transmission in there, so the first gear is a little bit more usable. But then, a lot of guys are bothered by that. Because then all of a sudden you have this gap, maybe second to third or third to fourth. So it's a compromise and it's a personal opinion whether the motocross gearbox is better. 
Um, I like doing very, uh, I would call it extreme differences in riding. I like going extremely slow and I like going really fast. So I'm the kind of guy that prefers a wider ratio trans, uh, transmission. A lot of people ride the same kind of flowy trails. They're never going crawling speed and they're never going mock speed. So they can actually gear their bike to suit what they're doing. Some people ride out in the desert and all that. They're never really using first gear. So they can gear their bike so first gear isn't so critical and their their fifth gear starts working. So um, that's probably uh, one of the uh, one of the biggest issues is the, is the transmission. And then the tuning of the motor is, is pretty high strung as well. Uh, the other thing about the Suzuki is, guess what? You have a Kickstarter, which yes. means that you're never going to get stranded out in the uh, in the forest because your battery died and you don't have a Kickstarter like what happens on your Yamaha. But you could be sitting there kicking it for five minutes. No, like not I, if you know how to kick it. I Logan, don't know. Do you know how to kickstart a motorcycle? <clears throat> not a full size bike, but yes. oh, not a full size bike. Well, apparently I don't know either. Yeah. Well, oh, you you've never had to kickstart your full size bikes? No, I have, but not the Suzuki. I oh. couldn't start that one. Really? Yeah. If I like, I was doing motos at Glen Helen one day, and uh, I stalled it in a corner, and I was riding with a friend, and he lapped me before I could start with the bike. Oh, you kids that have grown up on that button. Just like find top dead center and give it a nice smooth but kick. He is six one, so he's probably got some better leverage than I would. Oh, did he start it for you? No, no, I'm saying this Joe Doyle guy. Oh, he'd oh. have an easier time starting it. Yeah, would. <laughs> you short guys don't like Kickstarters. <laughs> no, I like those buttons. Yeah. Huh? Was it ejected? Yeah. No, yeah. No, yeah. I've never had a problem starting a fuel injected uh, four stroke yeah. for the most part. Um, it's just, it's easy to flood them, you know, if you just get kind of excited or a lot of times if the clutch is dragging, but usually when they stall, when they've tipped over, when they stall, they're still kind of clean. It's not like gas is spilling out into the intake track or doing anything weird. Um, so, but, uh, yeah, I don't like kickstarting anything either. <laughs> I don't even like kickstarting mini bikes. <laughs> so let's see. Oh, we have another, we have a question about tech talk taco Tuesday. Uh, next one. Oh, hey, someone someone also commented. I'm going to go back and grab this comment here. Um, uh, Craig Albert says um, people generally buy helmets that are too big, and he said he sold helmets for two decades, and that is absolutely true. Uh, they don't have them fitting as tight as they probably should. And the problem is a lot of times when people put on a helmet that may be a size, the right size, it's not the right shape. And so it's it's the right size, but it's squeezing on the a wrong part of the cranium for them. You know, it might be pushing on the side of the skull, the front of the skull. And different helmets fit differently. That's why it's important to go try them on. And and another thing, if you're going to go into a shop and try on helmets, please buy the helmet from the shop you're trying it on. Because if you're going to do that and then run back to the Internet and buy it cheap, you're just – you're really causing a, a problem in the – ability for you to ever be able to try on a helmet ever again <laughs> there's a reason why that shop's there the guy the the, the 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 parts guy actually managed to stock that um just kind of a personal take i don't mind buying stuff on the internet and stuff if you know what you're buying but if you're going to go try some stuff on um in a shop buy from that shop there's a reason why they're there and they're they're doing you a service by uh doing that and that's that's pretty important in this world uh let's see What's our question? Oh, this is this is a long. Do we skip a page? I think there's a, there was a long question about. Oh, is people talking to him about the? Uh, yeah, M C M M C N V M C rider Nevada M C rider responded. I weigh the same as you and ride a 250F off road, and tight stuff, and it works awesome. Under 35 mile per hour. The 250F is faster because of its lighter feel and the you can only put so much power into the ground speeds above 35 mile per hour and the 450F starts to catch up and obviously the faster you go, the 450F has an advantage. The, I had an... 07 YZ 250F and currently ride a 250 FWR 2015 and they are great bikes for tight conditions 
The only drawback is the MX250F is the five-speed transmission and close ratio gearbox. I would recommend the 2015 over later Yamaha YZ250F X or WR. Sounds sounds like he's going down the same path that we are for mm-hmm. more more or less. Mm-hmm. So you don't need us. Um, you just uh, just pay attention to what people answer in the forums. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what was uh, I was was I yelling at the screen today when I saw somebody uh, replacing a a gear? Yes, you were. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, a good friend of ours. Yes, uh, dirt, <laughs> dirt bike TV J uh, was placing a pa- plastic gear on a on a on a KTM, and and he had incited fear in some of our viewers because I got forwarded the video. And they're like, "Is this going to fail? Do I need to change this? Is this is this a is this a problem?" So it was the plastic oil pump gear on a newer, not most recent, a newer KTM 250 or 350. Uh, they have a gear that runs off the the crankshaft that runs the oil pump. This is a common KTM thing. Um, they they use a plastic gear in there uh, for the oil pump. And they have for a long, long time. And I, I know there were certain models like the old KTM 530 where it could become problematic. Uh, but that was also a bike that tended to run uh, extremely hot. And it had two oil pumps that were also run off plastic gears. And I think the problem more was that the motor liked to, over time, shed material, which caused a little bit of drag inside the oil pump, which caused a little bit of friction inside the gears. And yes, you could buy you know aluminum uh, replacement gears for the plastic ones and sort of solve the problem. But if you actually had a real problem, it became much more catastrophic. It's like nothing is free that you can't, there's, there's an equal and opposite reaction to everything that you change. So if you're going to make those gears, not just simply break, uh, you know, or start wearing funny and it, and w- when your when your oil pump, it's really rare oil pump seize up, but they do or start having problems. But generally, there's other problems that cause that. When that kind of stuff starts happening, if you're changing your oil on a regular enough basic ba- uh, uh, basis, you would see some of that plastic gear material on your oil filters, mostly on the screen. Remember, we were talking about the screen today, Trevor. Yep. Yeah. And then, and then if it, if it was small enough and generally it's big enough to where it gets trapped in that strainer filter, it would make it onto the, you would have this black dust on your paper or screen filter, the small filter. And that's how you start chasing. Okay. You see, okay, there's plastic. Where does it come from? I I always, I get this question on KTM stuff all the time. It's like, well, there's a little bit of plastic, oil pump gears. That means something's something's starting to go wrong. It's if, if you start seeing material in your oil filters, find out where it comes from. And when the bike's brand new, don't worry too much about it because there's a lot of stuff that's floating around in there. Gasket material, um, sealers, uh, you know, little, uh, you know, traces of stuff that's going to get cleaned out in your first couple oil changes. But if your bike has 50 hours on, all of a sudden you start seeing plastic or all of a sudden you start seeing um, some, you know, a lot, a lot more than usual metallic debris, whether it's aluminum, Oh, that, that usually goes back to the clutch or something is loose and rubbing on something in the case, uh, you know, aluminum slash magnesium. You start seeing, you know, pieces of metal, they're, they're magnetic. You can put a magnet on them and it's like, oh, that's gear facing or, you know, some gear parts. Uh, you see shiny gold pieces. That's your big or small end bearing. That's the brass coating on that or, or the, the, the bearings, the bushings that are on the side of the crank. So, uh, write down how to tell when your bike's going to blow up. (laughs) But but the plastic gear isn't usually a problem. Now, here's where Jay was right. KTM has superseded this part, but that's very, very common. And, and, And they assumed that if KTM superseded the part, that that meant that it was a improved part. Not so quick. And this isn't just KTM, it's any manufacturer. Sometimes they change the vendor, okay? That's why they change the part number. Sometimes uh, things like they change the price or the warehouse that it's in, inventoried in or the country of origin, you know, the materials had to be updated or it causes cancer in the state of California and they had to put a different decimal code on the stinking. I've heard of all those 
reasons for updating part numbers, not because that part was bad and it fails. Although he did show, and this is why I started yelling at the video. He did show the fact that this plastic gear had some mauling on the face of the gear. Well, mauling, spalling, spalling, mauling, gnawling, gnawling, with a G N gnawling. How do you spell? How do you? Okay, so so the face of the gear is getting defaced. What do you call? That's spalling. Spalling with an S. No S. S. Yeah S. Like shit. Yeah. It's going to shit. Okay, so the face of the gears that he was... Logan, plug your ears. <laughs> <laughs> the face of the gears are going to shit. Did this... And so right away I go, okay, did this motor ever run low on oil without oil? Like, did something get caught in the on the oil pump that kind of dr made it drag for a little while? Was the bike broken in a little bit rough? Maybe we're... You know, you think about it. You know, just when that bike was brand new, those that 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 oil pump could have like gotten hot in there, and it could have literally started seizing. And if you look at oil pumps, it's a very tight tolerance. And whenever I pull them apart, they're more scarred on the sides than any place else because it's a tight tolerance. And if you, you know, if something gets hot in there when it's brand new, it breaks itself in. So who knows what happened? Um, but. Uh, so some of our viewers were very concerned, and so they turned to Jimmy to just break it down. So I hopefully I broke that down, and your bike doesn't break down. But if you're concerned, it's only a $35 part. You can go ahead and change it. <laughs> but if you're not having a problem, don't worry about it. Just keep riding that damn bike. My KTM 350 has mm, 450 hours on it right now. Still ticking. Haven't done a thing to it other than cam chain tensioner that thing that we pulled out last night of the, of one of your bikes while we were doing the top end, which I was going to talk about as well. Cause that's <laughs> comical also. <laughs> Next. Joe Doyle. I think you replied to the, <laughs> yeah. What, the, did, what did Joe Doyle say? Nevada motorcycle rider. Good advice. I would definitely prefer the Yamaha, but as usual, Suzuki comes with a smaller price tag. And uh, what's the response from uh, NVMC rider? Um, pay attention to the extra money and get the E-Start and six-speed transmission. Plus, the Yamaha are super reliable. I want to know where he's getting that six-speed transmission, that Yamaha, don't you? Mm -hmm. I think it is. Oh, on the 250, yeah. Yeah. Okay, that's right. I was thinking 450. No, I think 250 yeah. is our six-speed. Right. Oh, good. Yeah. That's that's the difference in price could not buy you an electric start or a six speed, no. but you could always buy a KTM. It has both of those things too. And then that'd be like triple the price. That's a Suzuki. Triple the price. No, you should just get a KTM 500 and not worry about anything else. Cause that at, a, at your size, there's no better bike for, I don't even know what ability level you are, but at your, at whatever you just said, like, I don't know anything, but I can say KTM 500 is the best bike. What about Husaberg? They're impossible to get. They're rarity. They're like, they're fine wine. They're collector's <laughs> items. I, I know somebody, Chris Barrett's dad, Mike Barrett, yeah. just got his second one. He bought his first one about four months ago. He's got number two now. Oh. Right. It, it's, <laughs> well, he's just like me. You can't just have one. Because if one breaks, you would cry. Like when mine broke, like I cried. Like the, ask, ask all the guys on Hondas that I was riding with. They laughed. But I cried, and I, but I had, but at least I knew when I came home, I could put that one away and fix it, and I could go ride my other one, and everything was okay. Yeah, it's like with that much power, Bob. Like, I mean, you know, because the one that I rode was your bike that I bought for a substantially reduced price because I gouged my um, people that sell me motorcycles. Only because I got tired. You got tired of working on it. No, if I have to work on it, it's yeah. like working on a street bike. Yes. <laughs> working on it is like working on a street bike. It's worse than that, but yeah, I don't ever want to work on one. Right, nor do I. Okay. So why did you sell it to me? Uh, because I was looking for a sucker to get. Sucker, yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. They Back then they were cheap, but now that I talk about them so much, the price is, he's, everybody's telling me I'm wrecking the price. Cult yeah, cult bike. Yeah. yeah. Hey, actually, I heard you had one in your shop for a long time that wasn't yours. Not mine. Yeah, and you weren't allowed to tell me it was even there. Well, that's what I thought he told. Yeah, I did. Yeah. I think he was concerned that you would do what you did. Do what? what? You did. Oh, try to buy it from him or just take it? Oh, switch parts. <laughs> Stay, get the best parts off of it. No, it's stock is best. Okay, 
Logan, where are we at now? The CRF 250L. CRF 250L. Underbridge Rock. That's an easy name. Yeah. Would you trust somebody that's calling themselves Underbridge Rock? Iffy. Iffy. <laughs> <laughs> On my list for the spring, I really like the KTM 790, but for 2.5 times the price, nah. Didn't Trevor just say that? You can pay three times the price and just get a KTM? Yeah. Or you can buy a Honda 250L. There you go. Yeah. Um, it's still not blue, so it's still, <laughs> that's still the problem. <laughs> uh, I don't see how CRF 250L and KTM 790 even come into the same discussion. I mean, just, just, just to begin with, I think you're more around like KTM 390, which comes in under the price of the, the Honda. Um, so it's... Uh, it, it, I, I, I I, I got to talk to the, there's uh, I will get to this Todd Kelly. I got to talk, bring this question kind of down to that. So we'll hold off on giving my complete answer to Underbridge Rock. Jason. Disher. Disher. Yeah. Oh, so close. Good job, Logan. Uh, the dirt bike study tip is working. But that, I think he's talking about your, uh, your, your almost, you did a good read and then you couldn't remember what this show is about. <laughs> and that's why I'm putting you on the point right now. What is this show about? Um, motorcycle products and motorcycle-related. Products again? <laughs> 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 Actually, I have, I have a button for that someplace in here. It, if I had my stuff that wasn't all jacked up. Um <laughs> Jimmy, you're so mean. Uh, okay. So uh, Todd Kelly, that's the guy who just gave you, uh, um, he said, oh, he said uh, he gave us a share in a few in a few groups and he asked if it would bring any views. Uh, yes, it did. Todd, thank you for that. I'm going to go ahead and read this question. All right. He says, hey, butt. And I think he meant buddy, but maybe he meant butt, <laughs> like butthead or ass. Um I was just trying to ask a simple question before your podcast last night. It's not a podcast. I had no idea you were going to be having the dude who organizes a tour of Idaho on the show. I'm going to break here for a second. It's like, I go to the experts. I don't just, uh, you know, when you have a question or, you know, something like that, I bring the experts in, but uh, I did. And yeah. But love how you use my question to highlight the stupid questions you get asked and are burdened with answering. And this is where I'm going, oh, no. God, did I really do that? If you need, if you read the question closer, you would have seen that I'm not looking at doing the tour, but rather going some experience and taste for riding in Idaho. Uh, that's the way it was written. Um if you didn't come across like a dirt bike elitist, you'd probably get more fans listening and asking questions. Uh, I just had a simple jetting question. Uh, going up an elevation typically requires X and Y changes. I wasn't looking for exactly 165 main jet, 40 lead check, et cetera, but rather some direction. Instead of putting me in the right direction and helping what little you might have been able to do, you had to make me out to be some kind of complete dirt bike idiot. I'm still listening, but I probably won't ask stupid questions anymore. <laughs> so hold on, we got we, we got to take a question from the crowd. Owner's manual. Owner's manual. Okay. No, 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 no. Here's and, and I responded back to Todd, and I appreciate him listening. And I didn't mean to put him on the spot, and or I did use his question to highlight the quote, the 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 bombarding of questions his question started with i'm gonna ride a tour of idaho and i'm wondering about this bike i'm thinking about that bike and i have this bike and then i'm thinking about the jetting but that's on that bike and it's like there were so many levels in there that by the time i got down to the jetting part i'm like i just get a fuel injected bike <laughs> <laughs> and and it's it's not on him it's on my attention span uh and then that's really the way that 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 I that I think, and there's no way in the world that I could ever. Oh, he also mentioned the modifications he had on his bike, and so there's no way in the world that I could like knowingly give him any like logical jetting advice based on once you start. If if it's a stock bike and I've ridden that stock bike, I can probably 
give you a, a, an idea on the jetting. If if your bike does this, then it does that. If you tell me exactly what your bike's doing, but he never really described what his bike was doing for me to 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 diagnose the symptom and recommend a solution. Just going up an altitude doesn't necessarily... I've ridden bikes up an altitude where I had to increase the jet sizes. I had to richen them up. It There's no... there's there, You know, majority of the time you lean them out. And it depends on what bike it is, how it responds. Like there's certain bikes, all you do is drop the needle a little bit. Other bikes, you have to do a main and a pilot jet. Don't touch the needle. Other bikes, you do something as simple as, you know, block off some air openings in the air box and you don't have to change the jetting. Honda's with the perimeter aluminum frame, because God knows I never want to take another one of those carburetors out. And then we kind of got down to the point where it's like, oh, you have a Yamaha 450? I don't want to take the carburetor out of that bike either. I would just figure out how to get another bike. That's <laughs> that's where I am in my world. So, so Todd, um, I, I didn't, it just, it was question overload. And yeah, I did bring Martin in to kind of talk about Tour of Idaho because it was peak tour season. Um, I enjoy listening to Martin. He's a physicist. And he wanted to grill me on my love of black helmets in the summer. And I wanted to tell him that he didn't ride some of the trails on the Tour of Idaho that he said he rode, that I rode, that he put in there, and then I got screwed up on. And frankly, to illustrate this, Tour of Idaho is no damn joke. And he actually did ride it. He rode it downhill, and I rode it uphill. Big difference. <laughs> so, uh, uh, But I like to have a good uh, argument or joust or you know, conversation, whatever you want to call it. And that's what I'm doing with your question right now is just telling you that, um, I know I do appreciate the questions. You're not an idiot, largely because you came to us to ask the question, which is, that's patting myself on the back. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it was like, it was just kind of question overload. What I wasn't too mean, was I? I don't think so. Yeah, you're just saying that because you're sitting next to me. <laughs> you guys are both going to walk away and go, man, Jimmy's so mean. It's like, all he did was pick on me this show. I couldn't even get that <laughs> damn slogan right. It's called, it's it's about, this show's about, <laughs> it's not written here. Don't read it. No. <laughs> no. What is it, Trevor? Um, dirt bikes and dirt, right, dirt bike related <laughs> products. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you know how you learn how to do this? You go in the shower and you just start singing it. <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to tell you that's what I do. Um, hey, you know, if you want to know the real answer to the questions, there's a, there's a thing up on the thing that just reminded me. Uh, tacomoto.co. Um, this is Mike Spurgeon. He runs the EXC and FE performance or related questions groups on the Facebooks. There's always good questions up there. If I respond to the question you put on that group, by the way, on on Mike's uh, thing, it's gold. They don't you, there. Nobody else has to respond to it. It's the only answer you need to know. Just saying that out loud. And now I'm going to get beat up tomorrow for <laughs> for for doing that. But uh, so yeah, we just answer stuff largely from experience here, um, because we've tried it, tested it. If I don't know, I'm the first guy to say I don't know, and then I start looking for the expert to answer my question. Um, and a lot of my experience isn't just my experience. It's from, you know, talking to guys like Trevor who rides and tests stuff. And when, when he knows something more than I do, that's when I pass the question over to him. And when I need somebody to say that this show is about motorcycle and motorcycle related products, I ask Logan or Trevor to say it and then they botch it. <laughs> and then it makes us all look like ding dongs. So, uh, so I was going to get back to um, uh, the thing about the CRF 250. Um, so when someone comes to me and says, I'm thinking about a KTM 790, but I think the CRF 250 L is more in my price range. That just, that's, that's, you know how when somebody just doesn't know, like, let let me talk about the Tour de France today. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they rode bicycles. That Lance Armstrong, he won, right? No, no, he did drugs. Oh, that's right. But he Heard got away it. with it. And yeah. he, he's still on the Tour de France, right? Yeah. Yeah, got it. So, I know I don't know anything about it. So, I'll <laughs> say stuff that's absolutely, completely ridiculous. Um, I know just enough to be dangerous at something like that. <laughs> but sometimes, you know, when you talk to somebody and ask a question, it's just it's just out of bounds for somebody that's in the know. You know, if it's it just like those two bikes don't fit in the same category. They're in... Other than the fact that they're kind of both adventure bikes, they're just in different, completely different ranges. 
And it, it, that's why you listen to a podcast like this. That's why you, you watch this video. You try to learn. You want to be educated. We have a lot of smart people in our chat room that will, if you ask a question in there, they'll try to answer it because they're going to they're gonna diffuse the question before I, before I kind of see it or something, you know, just, just to, just to break it down. And, and we had a question that somebody said, um, uh, Jeff, uh, Benick says, looks like I might score a KTM 950 super and drill. Okay. So here's, here's, here's where we start with this question. This is what I do. I break stuff down. He may have this bike. He may be getting this bike. Doesn't have it. Doesn't even exist yet in his world. So what do you think he's thinking about? What do you suggest for tires going to use to cruise Baja on dirt roads and local <laughs> rides with old guys from uh, OCMC? So he doesn't even have the bike, and he's worried about the tires he's going to get for it. <laughs> uh, that's that's where my brain goes on this. It's like, get the bike first and just ride it with whatever's on it, and then at least you have a baseline to kind of decide before you start asking for it. But then I start thinking about it. It's like, there's people that, that are going to go buy a brand new $12,000 KTM 500 EXC that really works quite well for what it is. And they already have the list in their head of the stuff they're going to do to modify it. There's guys that are buying a brand new Yamaha, Kawasaki, Suzuki, Honda 450. And before they even ride it, they know what suspension tuner they're going to send their stuff off to. And it's, it's just a different world, you know, for, mm -hmm. for me, because I like to, figure out how everything is. And then it's like, okay, do I need to fix this? It's like a, it's like a, a path, but, um, Jeff, uh, Kenda big blocks, <laughs> uh, Jimmy has to declare that Kenda <laughs> does support, uh, his off-road riding school and, uh, no, it, it, and, and yeah, I'm, I'm completely transparent about this. I don't know if that'd be the tire I'd put on that bike, especially if you're going riding down a Baja because, you might want something maybe a little more aggressive, but then what size rims are on the bike? You know, are they still stock? Have they put narrow rims, which is kind of a common thing to do so you could have a bigger tire selection on that particular bike. Uh, do you want to run more of a knobby? Are you going to be riding it mostly on off-road and very rarely on-road? Uh, there's so many concerns when it comes to tires, and that's why um, I always say, you know, the good thing about the tires, you can put it on and you can use it. If you don't like it, don't buy that one again. Try something new. You know, try different things. And when you start stumbling upon things that you like, kind of go down that path. I will tell you that the Dunlop D606 and the 908 work very well on that bike because that's a more aggressive bike. It's not really your typical adventure bike. And so on, on when I had the BMW HB2, I tended to run true knobby tires on my bike because the performance that bike benefited heavily from having a good tire on it as opposed to like a 50-50 tire, like a Kenda Big Block or a TKC8 or a Michelin, Michelin Anarchy Wild. And then if I uh, didn't mention that tire brand, your favorite tire brand in that, it's because there's a compromise someplace in that 50-50 world. Uh, like your tire lasts forever. Well, yeah, it doesn't have any traction. Or it has really good traction. It doesn't last at all. So it's a compromise. Oh, boy. Diving in deep tonight, huh? <laughs> What was that? What, what did we just talk about? Like, what would you, how would you summarize what we just talked about, Logan? Tires? <laughs> <laughs> well, Derek, make a note. <laughs> that's, that's very simple. Um, let's see if we have any other. Uh... Oh, remember that van we saw in the parking lot? I said that was, that was uh, Wes? Yep. Yeah, he has a question. Did you answer the question about the, Plastic mini bike stuff, crank stuffers. Do you have any durability data comparing aluminum to the plastic and the high RPM, high heat motors? So uh, Wes uh, sent me a picture of this. Is uh, his wife's uh, KTM eighty five? Maybe you guys, you guys might be the experts of this one. You guys have had KTM eighty five experience, yeah, Jimmy? Yeah. Yeah. So he had. He showed me a ball of plastic and said it sounded like his piston came apart. But the crank stuffer broke, and it came off. And I'm like, wow, I, I'm not a KTM 85 expert by any means. Yeah, they're plastic. A lot of you know, a lot of a lot of two strokes have plastic crank stuffers in there. And so, no, I haven't answered on the show, but I'm going to try to break it down. Like he had a ball of plastic in there, and I'm like, okay, that if 
I and I didn't see whether the piston broke or anything else. Just showing me this picture of this ball of plastic, and I'm like, that's not good. Yeah, that's the crank stuffer coming apart. And to me, I'm going, something else is wrong. There's some vibration in there that caused it to break off. Or, and he did a little research because I said, hey, research it. You're going to find information on this someplace. Because I, I remember hearing something about it and some of that, like, in, in, how do you say it? Nihilo? Nihilo concepts. Nihilo concepts. They make aluminum stuffers that bolt in there to replace the plastic ones. And I kind of remember seeing a picture of something like that or somebody talking about it. And if they make something like if they go to the effort to make something like that, if a company makes a part that replaces something that you can't see on the outside, doesn't have a lot of bling, there's usually a reason for it. And so whether there's a durability issue, and I thought maybe there was some vibration that caused it, but he said it's because the, the main bearing starts making enough heat that it goes out there and gets that plastic a little bit soft. And, and somebody said it's a sign of the main bearing starting to go out. So, no, I haven't really dug that deep into it um, other than the information that you brought back to me. But that does make sense. And uh, I'm not really uh, – I'm not – I'm not fluent on that particular one, but I'd love to know how that turns out. And if you're going the distance to put those things in there, um, let's do a test on it with dirt bike test. Uh, yeah, it's the little two strokes on the KTMs and and uh, those things. I, I think the KTM mini bikes are not as durable as some of the Japanese ones. We, Probably not. Yeah, and we have people. Logan, how many of those things? You blew up everything, didn't you, <laughs> mini bike wise? Pretty much. I don't know how because. Did you quit revving it after I beat you up on the show for revving, <laughs> over revving bikes? No. No. He you did. always rode no, like he that. Did. He did. After 65s, he, yeah. 65s he, he used to rev. He used to rev them, then he started. The, that 105, you couldn't rev it because there's no way you could hang on to that thing when you revved it. <laughs> he rode around like a toy. Go, it hit the power band, go, yeah. like that, and then he shut <laughs> off the ship. Uh, yeah. So, um, uh, Grant Plansky asks, have you tested the Garmin Montana 700i GPS slash inReach all-in-one unit? I just started testing it. No, I haven't tested it, um, but let me know how it goes. I would like to know. Um, I guess, do you want all-in-one unit? I don't know. Maybe yes. Actually, I'm, I'm not super stoked on Garmin stuff uh, lately. Just because they they they're like Apple, everything's proprietary, but yes. Garmin isn't big enough to be Apple. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like I don't like like to try to you know this because you use their their stuff on your for your heart rate and all yep. that stuff like that. I just want to get my damn track log off of my my Garmin like monitor, you know, my watch thingy, and I have to go through like seven steps of hell to get to a track log to see where I went. So I'd rather just have a GPS unit. So good luck with that, Grant. Um, <laughs> send me send me your share page <laughs> and we'll see how that works out um we have any other questions logan or we run through that whole thing in here yeah yeah what's next oh mark daniels wants to know what happened to my top fan status just asking i i replaced you <laughs> yeah you're you're a top fan over at rottweiler performance so uh i made you i um, I put San Felipe Bob as our main top fan. <laughs> and uh, actually, San Felipe Bob uh, responds to Charlie. says, we used to stuff the cranks in our full race Honda 250 quads. Wow, you just admitted you raced wow. a quad. <laughs> 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 Only the top level riders were able to take advantage of the added power and torque. <laughs> <laughs> and you raced a quad. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh there's a lot of talks about confused crank stuffers and quad ATV racing. Oh, Charles Barley asks, um, Jimmy, I bought a KTM 250 XCW TPI uh, partly because of the DBT review. Of the 2020 KTM XCWs, uh, of a review of the 2020 KTM, I cross-thread the oil level check screw. Planning to remove the right side of the engine trance case to replace that part. Um, does the case have the thread fixed? Let's see more. Hold on a second here. Let's see. Does that piece help align shafts, or can I remove only that piece in the clutch cover and replace it without removing the whole engine and having a very hard time aligning all the shafts in the engine and trance when I reinstall that piece of the case? 
So cross the oil, the oil level check screw only goes slightly into the case. You know what I would do? <laughs> okay, here's not recommended by KTM or any other mechanic. This is just Jimmy Lewis talking. I would just uh, drill it out and throw a, a, a thread cert in it without even removing the cover. Actually, when I did it, I would actually run the oil level up a little bit high. And uh, we'll talk about our the thing from last <laughs> night. I would run the oil level up a little bit high when I did this so that the oil draining out would carry the majority of the, the, the aluminum shavings when you do the drilling out. And I wouldn't worry about the pieces that went inside because the filter is going to – I have not have a filter. Um, it would just – it'll just flush it out. I wouldn't worry about it. Like those little pieces of aluminum aren't going to do any damage in there. Very few go in. But it only goes that, – that bolt only goes into the side cover a little bit. And, uh, yeah, you should be able to, uh, put a thread cert or helicoil inside of that and be in uh, good shape. I wouldn't stress at all about it. Just put, the, put, put an extra couple hundred cc's of oils in there when you do it. Very careful when you drill, you know, so that the, so the stuff flushes out, uh, very careful when you tap, just give it time. So the stuff flushes out and then Bob is waving his hand and he's going to tell me what you would do in an airplane no. besides <laughs> die after you just... Yeah, that's that's. I thought that's uh, common. Well, it, it, cra it grabs the stuff. Right. Yeah, because that's what I do when I do spark plug threads, mm -hmm. like on the vehicle that you might have bought for me with a rethreaded <laughs> spark plug, right? Mm -hmm. No, I no, don't do that. I put I put an I put anti seize I put anti seize on on things before I put them in there so that doesn't happen. Um, yeah, or the clutch cover comes off so easy on that bike. I would just take the clutch cover off and do it off the side, but that'd be the way that Trevor would do it, not the way with Jimmy would do it. <laughs> um, Craig Albert says extra circlips. Uh oh, did somebody know something? We didn't lose the circlip. No, we didn't. No, we lost something else. Um, <laughs> we lost something else. Let's see. If we, let's go down there. Do we have another question on the uh, on the thing there, Logan? The yeah, yeah. What's what do we got there? Uh, let's see. Jeffrey Wa Wag Hot Wagadol Wagadol. Uh, looking into a new dual sport after selling my WR four fifty. I'm torn between the Honda four fifty L and the Husky FE five hundred ones. Yes, I am aware of the KTM EXC five hundred also. Best bike ever for everybody. <laughs> How would you compare the two for desert riding? Not too concerned about the street manners, so that would minimal, but a plate is mandatory here in California. I would really set, I'm really set on the Honda, but I now am not sure. Please share your thoughts. Oh, by the way, my neighbor has a Husqvarna. 570 and definitely isn't lacking power. Why don't you want a Husaberg? You should actually, you should steal your neighbor's bike. He won't even hardly notice it, except you'll hear him crying every <laughs> night, like, because he knows that he won't be able to experience that awesome power, even though it's just hidden in your garage. Um, see, actually, what I'm getting from uh, Jeffrey is he only likes bikes that start with an H because he wants Hondas, Husabergs, and Huskies. See how I break stuff down? I don't really answer the question. Just like uh, um, <laughs> I can't remember the guy's name question last time. This is that, that point of the show where I start losing attention span. <laughs> um, so you're looking for desert riding bike with a plate. Um, the easier of those two would probably be the Husky because you're going to get a certain amount more performance just box stock right from the get-go. Uh, the Honda, little bit, little bit heavier feeling, but uh, okay. So you're going to get more in the Husky in the motor department, better in the handling and stability department on the Honda. Uh, if those two things, which is harder to change, which easier to fix, the Honda it's harder to get more power out of the Husky. It's harder to get the the chassis and everything working is good for desert type of stuff. So it, it's a toss-up. I think you're going to be happy with either of those two bikes, um, although none of them will be even close to a Husaberg. Or a Yamaha. Uh, well, Yamaha didn't even make anything over 450 for off-road riding. That's like, all it needs. Well, yeah. Blue crew has that much power. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
See, if you if you sponsored Trevor, your Yamaha <laughs> dealer, he would he would he would mention what dealer you should go get it at right now, right? I would. Yeah, you probably would. would. Probably would. Yeah, and we'll let him on the show, even if he does that, but, and I'll slap him around. But hey, if you're getting a Husky, you might as well go to Three Wheelers Racing. Oh, right now, the nation's yeah. number one Husqvarna dealer <laughs> and KTM dealer, for that matter. Uh, <laughs> next question, Logan. Um, Adam Diamond. Dement, yeah. He's. Oh, my son's riding a Sierra 50, five years old. He loves riding trails with me, and he's doing pretty well in the Pacific Northwest. What bike should I put him on next? Power and size wise, the 50 is fine, but he's going to need more chassis slash suspension. He seems to think he's ready for tiny hard enduro. Logan, that question is for you. You're the you're the most closest to that question out of everybody sitting at this table. I don't remember those days. What? I remember those days. I remember riding a it was it was called a monkey fifty at the time, a Honda Trail fifty. I remember riding it into the side of my friend's mom's car. And then I remember XR eighty. Right after short XR seventy five, XR eighty, right after that. I totally remember that. That was the move. That was that was where I was going. Actually, the, but the problem was, is I got a CT70, a Honda CT70 in between there, and that thing looked gay. <laughs> it just didn't look like a real dirt bike. It looked like a, like something a girl should be riding. <laughs> and I didn't really see myself in a dress at that point in my life. I mean, things may have changed, but... So, help him. Like, CRF50, um, five years old, loves riding trails. What, what do you think? You know what a CRF50 is, right? Yeah. KX KLX 110 KLX 110 Yeah What about the Yamaha? They make a TTR 110 Yes They also do What about What about one of the, the KTM like Competition More competition mini bikes Like those Like the bikes you 65? see 65 Well no not the 65 But even the uh, Like the SX 50 Or even that electric Even the electric KTM I mean Man there's The cool thing is like Imagine if If I was a kid back then Now and instead of the back then, like if I had all those things, you know how much better of a rider I would be? Because I would, I would have had it at like, right when I moved up, I would have got him a trainer. Like he needs to get him a trainer right now to start working on his trajectory for, you know, the, the off-road racing career he's about to have for Harden yeah. Rose. I, I would hire Graham Jarvis. <laughs> um, and then when you realize that Graham Jarvis doesn't say anything, you could send him over to me because I run an off-road riding school. Uh, this moment of information is brought to you by <laughs> www.jimmylewis racing offroad.com jimmy lewis offroad.com my own website uh uh we're actually we don't teach kids because they don't have attention spans for it kind of like this show most people don't have attention spans for it um crf 110 if you want to go red yeah yeah they're honda guys that might be good i would i would keep him man i hate to say this but i would keep him on a clutchless bike you know a bike with an mm -hmm. auto clutch in the beginning at five because I think there's a lot going on there, you know, to move to the clutch. And then and then maybe find some sort of junky bike with a clutch that you can have laying around that he could practice on. But that's not the one that you guys go riding together on. Because uh, Pacific Northwest is no kidding. Like, the trails there are gnarly. Uh, it's it's uh, slippery. And, and having to operate a clutch in that is, is a little bit difficult. Actually... What I'm going to recommend right now, uh, thanks to our sponsor, Recluse, is if you're an old man and you're having problems with your clutch, you can just buy a Recluse clutch, and it, it elevates you one skill level. So uh, if you have if you've stalled your bike the last time you rode it, if you've looped your bike out because you lost control of the clutch, um, if you're – let's see, which hand is your clutch on? Right, left. If your left wrist is getting tired from operating the clutch, you can just get yourself a Recluse auto clutch. Uh, they called they're called the core exp and a lot of different versions of that and uh, then you can just be like this five-year-old kid and not have to worry about clutches and go riding awesome places uh, with your kids <laughs> so uh, craig alberts um got my t-shirt wearing it now how come you guys aren't wearing your dirt bike test t-shirts that's not very good support well you're wearing climb that's good 
Uh, thanks, Craig. Thanks for supporting. If you want to, if you want to support the show, you can buy a T-shirt. And if you order it within the next twenty-four hours, I will actually ship it out sometime this week. But if you order after that, which means you watch this on YouTube and you said, "Damn, I want one of those awesome DirtBikeTest.com T-shirts," uh, it's going to be about two weeks because I'm going to go out rally training with uh, a bunch of rally guys so we can win the Dakar again next year. And uh, good, good times. They're going to go out and enjoy pain. <laughs> um, <laughs> So, any other questions? Uh, let's see. Oh, there's all kinds of all kinds of questions in there. Weren't you paying attention, Logan? You should have taught Logan. Uh, you should have taught. Um, should have taught Trevor how to do that. But between between, between the two of you, you should have fed me more questions. <laughs> uh, George is answering a question. Uh, how does what's he asking the question about? He's talking. He's talking about how to back bleed a break. Oh, we, we you know what? We should talk about what we did last night. We do. We should. Yeah, I've got the question. Oh, good. Um, are you ready for it? I don't know. Should we tell everybody what we were doing last night? Uh, I guess we'll just lead into the question. No, wait. Just you just tell everybody. You you tell everybody <laughs> what we were doing, why you're here, and what we were doing. So I've got. I know a guy who's uh he's looking to rebuild a top end on his KTM 250F. Mm-hmm. And so kind of just mainly just do the piston rings, um, check the valves, that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. So it all went pretty smooth from what I was, what I was told. And uh, when they went to put the, the head on, back on the cylinder head, they, uh, something fell inside the motor. No, it was the cylinder. I, I heard it was the cylinder. The cylinder. The cylinder, the cylinder yeah. was going back on. It was a cylinder alignment dowel, by yeah. the way. Yeah, I heard. I read it on the internet. And uh they told me it fell in the bottom end somewhere, or fell down into the motor. Right, and then they—they, they, I bet you they wanted to know how to get it out. Yeah, what? You know what I would say originally? I'm saying just grab that long little magnet thing and just stick it down there and fish it out. You want to know how concerned KTM is about weight savings on their motorcycles? It wasn't magnetic. Yeah, they make them out of non-ferrous, very lightweight metal. Oh. Yeah, right. Yeah, that's a that's a first for me. Instead of being those really thin, yeah, yeah. like. Thin little tiny ones. They have a little thicker one that's made out of aluminum or something. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, it, yeah. So, now you're really screwed. Well, the guys, <laughs> yeah, the guys in the garage were super screwed. They didn't know how to get it out because they fished around with that. In fact, one of them, I, I, I know this guy, he actually made a hook out of, out of, out of some wire and went fishing around there. But the way that crank uh, thing is designed, there's actually, a, you know, it's a channel that the oil can splash up and fall back down. And guess where that little thing went? Yeah, down into a place that was hard to find. Yes. Yeah. So what do I suggest they do? Yeah, what's like the best, easiest way to... You know what's funny it? is I heard, I heard those guys, they were talking in the, uh, in the garage. I overheard them, allegedly. And, and one of them said to the other, he said, what, what, what happens when you do this? I mean, has this ever happened before? And the, the old, like, kind of wiser guy just shrugged <laughs> his shoulders and said, yeah, it happened before. It's all the time. Here, let's flip the bike upside down. <laughs> so, so those two guys, they, they, it's how they got it out. I know, I know. They, um, they proceeded to drain the oil out, yep. um, you know, because we left the, I uh, know they, they left the oil in the, uh, <laughs> in the bike. Cause I mean, you, you don't, you don't need to taint the oil out to do the top end. And uh, cause here's, okay, here's what you can learn other than the other stuff you're going to learn from this. <laughs> here's what you can learn from this. What I usually do, and Trevor asked me, is this, should I change the oil before we do the top end? I'm like, no, leave the dirty oil in there because it needed to be done. And then after your first or second startup, then change the oil because if you get a little, because you always get a little bit of dirt or grime or whatever, so, that way it's going to come out with your oil change and you're cleaning your filters and then you're starting with fresh, fresh, fresh. So Bob's raising his hand, but I'm ignoring him right now because he's going to, he's going to, he's going to wonder, he, he, he wants to know who those guys were and I'm not going to tell him. I'm not going to tell him. What was that? Did you promote the mechanic that made the screw up? Oh, I shit. How many times do I have to pat myself on the back <laughs> in this podcast or show? It's not really a podcast. It is a podcast because we're back up on iTunes, everybody. Um, and you might be listening to it on iTunes, and that's that's awesome because we're not a test anymore. We're, we're, this is, we're not even in France. We're in the United States, in Pahrump, Nevada, Valley of the Dirt People, where <laughs> Logan lives. And Trevor wants to move. He was asking about home prices out here. <laughs> so so back to the story. Yeah. So we drain the oil. No, they drain the oil. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't know I don't know who this we is. <laughs> they drain the oil out, uh, got the oil out of the bike, and then uh, proceeded to make the bike do a front flip, kind of like uh, Travis Pastrana. Yep. 
right? Who's right there. You can kind of illustrate, but front flip. And then we strategically placed rags so that the majority of the oil didn't end up on the floor because a lot of oil is still in your motor even after you drain it. There's lots of little things. And rolled it forward and got it upside down, and magically that little part just uh, fell back out. So not the ideal way to go about doing a top end. But I did suggest to, um, I mean, the guy that was working on suggested the, to the young apprentice guy, he said, maybe you should think about turning your bike upside down when you do the top end so nothing falls into the bottom end <laughs> in the future. Good thing it wasn't a Harley. <laughs> <laughs> Good thing it wasn't a Harley. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so what uh, What I learned is is it, I need to be a little more careful because I'm just so used to just doing this stuff and little things like that usually don't happen. But the one time it would have been so much easier just to pluck those things out and reassemble them, but I just left them in place. And when we were jingling around that cylinder, because I tell you what, that was one of the more difficult um, pistons to, to get the rings to compress to go into the cylinder. Uh, and I put the rings in the orientation that I typically like to put them in, you know, the offset that I like to put them in, and it just did not want to go on that way. And I had to orientate them a little bit different. And knowing from talking to a lot of different guys that build very high horsepower motors and know what they're talking about, I was either 180 degrees on or 180 degrees off because I've had two different guys that both make incredible power out of 250cc four-stroke motors tell me to do it one way or the other. And I favored one more than the other, uh, mostly just based on um, uh, kind of what I thought, not necessarily what they told me or anything. Just And, and so, but I went 180 degree off and, and it, how, how long did it take the second time? My 10, 10 seconds. Yeah, 10 seconds. 10 seconds, as opposed to the how many minutes did we do it the first time? 20. 20. <laughs> yeah. I don't know why. And and I don't know that the manual tells you exactly where. We didn't have a manual, by the way. Yeah. I don't know if it tells you exactly where they want the ring openings to land based on where the cutouts in the cylinder, all that stuff were. So anyways, uh, yeah, good times last night, Trevor. Yes. It, Trevor was yawning because it was way past his bedtime, kind of like right now. You're yes. doing pretty good. We're getting... What time are you getting up tomorrow morning to ride your bicycle? Five forty-five. I'll, I'll go. <laughs> Tour de France. <laughs> Tour de France. Oh, you watch, the, you watch the feed and then get all jazzed up and ride your no, motorcycle. They, they start around that time. So I figured if I'm going to be Tour de France next year, I should probably get used to that. So, um, Let's see. I'm looking at some questions. Tell us about the KTM 390 Adventure. Uh, our video will do that for you. Um, I was a quad mechanic, not the rider. Good job, San Felipe Bob. You just saved yourself 20 push-ups. Um. Why don't bikes have oil pressure gauges? Eric Hermstead asks. Um, they're trying to make them as light as possible. Uh, but generally, and on your bike specifically, Trevor, and a lot of KTMs, they have an oil-activated hydraulic cam chain tensioner. And you want to know how when you lose oil pressure? It gets really loud really quick. <laughs> uh, yes, Bob? Gauges make you paranoid. Gauges make you paranoid. Yeah. Uh, I agree with that. Let's see. Um, let's see if there's any other questions like that. Um, just jam a self threader into it. They're talking about how to fix the thing. You can get a lot of good advice from the uh, form, by the way, and and some really bad advice, like most of the stuff you pick up on the internet, which is kind of like what you're where you're seeing this, right? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Different part of the internet. Different though. part, though. Because yes. we're on the dark webs, right? That's what you told me? I meant the good side of the internet. Oh, the good uh, side, yeah. Informational. <laughs> informational. Uh, uh, Troy Hicks says, Prump is clean, but... Oh, Prump is cheap, but sucky. I found out that Troy lives out here someplace. Um, I saw some something where he posted or... Yeah, value the dirt people, Troy. I think you're one of us. And don't... Do you have the shirt? <laughs> Actually, we should go riding sometime if if you want to, and I can you can earn one of the uh, the the Fuck You Nevada uh, t shirt or stickers. So be careful with that, Troy. Yeah, there's lots of horror stories out there. Hey, we're gonna we're we're gonna go riding before you leave, right? When do you have to leave? Sunday, Tuesday, Thursday. You're, you're probably Thursday. You're moved out here, probably Thursday. Okay, we should go riding. I gotta go get my stuff, bring it back. 
That's why <laughs> Logan wants. <laughs> Logan, you want to go riding? Yeah. Yeah, you can ride that YZ125, rev the shit out of it, maybe blow it up. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. Uh, and Troy Hicks comments, I haven't bathed in a year. <laughs> well, you fit right into Prump, and that's why it's dirty. <laughs> uh, are we all done? Yeah. We're all done with the questions. Are you done with me? You don't know? You don't even have to go to school tomorrow, do you? Um, Not at school, but I... You have to go. You're going to yeah. learn something, though, right? Yep. What are you going to learn? Probably something about algebra. Okay, good. It'll help. It'll help like critical thinking. It'll help uh, when you flip the bike upside down. You'll know the right geometry and the right angle of the bike to get that. Let's see. With algebra, I'm not seeing that. Maybe. I'm not putting those two, the right two together. The force and the force. Well, something. actually, you know, you know, what was really the most interesting thing about holding that bike upside down because we didn't go to the complete flip right away. <laughs> we actually bounced it up and. No, the, those guys that were in the garage. <laughs> <laughs> so I had it nice and balanced. I had like one finger on the brake. And by the way, your brake, your, your hands are not that big, are they? No. Medium. There's no way your brake lever should be that far away from the grip. I like a super touchy. Uh, no. no I, I, <laughs> look, I coach riders. I'm telling you that that's a bad thing. There's a, I, there's hate, a, I hate Jimmy's front brake lever position. No, it doesn't have to be mine. It needs to be modulated because <laughs> there's no way you can control that brake properly like that. But anyways, his brake was so far out my hand, my little teeny <laughs> tiny hand. I, I could barely, I could barely reach the lever and, and I grip it. Middle finger too. I mean, well, good for you. Yeah. <laughs> um, but so anyways, I had the bike and I had like a little bit of pressure on the front brake, you know, and I was just kind of squeezing that thing. And I had my hand, I was just like, the bike was balanced on me. I'm like, here, Trevor, come and hold that. And it was like he was doing a freaking bench press underneath the thing with the the headset was folding underneath him. He's tipping. I was like, whoa, hold on. So we got it straightened out. And I, you know, are you good? And, and like, he's pushing it over on me. I'm like, no, get get the balance. <laughs> we just fought about balance for like, you know, a good 30 seconds. Yeah. Like you got, because it looked like he was going to crush him. <laughs> we finally got it balanced. And then, and then I had to, I had to use that technique that we, we put up a little, um, a thing yeah. on the Insta is it Instagrams, Instagram and Facebook. Uh, follow us on Instagram yeah. uh, if you want to learn little tech tips every once in a while on how to move your, uh, you know, how to. Uh, we actually talk about moving the timing, you know, and how to get the cams to move without a Kickstarter because you usually have to push on a Kickstarter. But an electric start's not very technical, but you can put the bike in like fifth or sixth gear and move the rear wheel and very carefully. So I was trying to <laughs> to to get it. Get the you know the the piston to move to a different location so I could f look in there and fish it out and like I was like gonna kill Trevor his bike was gonna fall on him <laughs> he's out of balance Yamaha would have helped that though <laughs> 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 yeah because on a Yamaha you would have had to take the motor out of the frame no we just wouldn't have had to change yeah, the top yeah end. because you would have had to be doing the crank at the same time how many how many hours are on your KTM 250 57 hard racing hours. Sure, you could say that. And that thing looks brand new. Yeah, I mean, it was really, 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 really in good shape. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So all you guys worried about how, you know, Trevor rides the crap out of these things, and he had a good 50 Sometimes. hours on it. Yeah. When do you not, when do you not, when are you not racing? Uh, you practice and you race. That's true, yeah. Yeah, so you're going, you're going hard on that thing all the time. 50 hours at top, I mean, you're top of the food chain level. You're, you're, you're way up there in the A class. The, what do they call it? What do they call it? Pro 2? Pro 2, yeah. Yeah, you're up there. That's as hard as you're going to ride that bike. And that thing had 50 hours on it. And the reason we took it apart was A, number one, because it's smart because he wants to have a, he's got to race it for another 50 hours before the end of the year before he gets his blue bike. <laughs> and, and, and we wanted to test a piston, another piston. So we have a vertex going in there. Yep. Or it's in there right now. Uh, we have a Vertex in there, so we wanted to test the piston for 50 hours, and now we have the stock one to compare it to. We have the stock rings and everything, and so that's how we test stuff. We actually don't just, like, you know, shoot a couple pictures and say, yeah, this is great. Here, <laughs> buy our website, you know. It's, uh, you know, buy it off our website. No, we're testing it. So, well, everybody, uh, God, we're still, we still have 36 people watching us. Everybody fell asleep. That's what happened. They forgot to shut their browser <laughs> off. <laughs> so, uh, hey, thanks for joining in. Thanks for uh, enjoying some good times with us. Uh, thanks for commenting. Uh, if you're watching on the YouTubes, leave some comments. Uh, share this uh, podcast or YouTube video with your friends. Uh, tell a friend. Oh, hey, you want to see something really cool? I'm going to hold this up. If you're live, you get to see something really cool right now. Thanks for sticking around. You might not know exactly what this is, but uh, just look at that. Yeah. 
and, and you're listening, and you, you'll see this on the YouTubes also, that's probably going to be in front of you real quick. So, uh, yeah, good times. Uh, super top secret drop of information. With that, Logan, what do we say? See you out on the trail. Uh, put your thumbs up and say cheers. Cheers.